is Stuart Henderson. I'm a PhD student at Cambridge, uh, and this is about my project about the English leather industry, which is in partnership with the Museum of Leathercraft, which is based in Northampton. And actually, kind of echoes Naomi's presentation about how to, if, if you're doing a PhD project, how to you know, let the museum know if you're going to actually base some of your project on something that they have. This might be a good way for future projects to take place would be to actually involve them from the beginning and have something in place in writing and in agreement before anything starts. I can't take credit for any of that, however, because it wasn't me that set it up. It was uh, set up by the Open Oxford Cambridge doctor Doctoral Traineeship Programme, mouthful, and the, it's funded by the AHRC. And from the beginning, even in the interview process, Graham Lampard, as the curator, was there. So they've been involved from the very beginning. So, but before I talk about the museum in more detail, I think it's probably worth mentioning leather and giving a brief introduction to leather because I think when you say leather, it might not conjure up any specific thoughts beyond maybe just the material or just the shoes. I don't think it, it has that same cultural connection that maybe it should. Uh, for, I mean, it's probably, it, it's one of the oldest manufacturing processes in the world, if not the oldest. And for centuries in Britain, it was the second largest employer of people behind the wool industry. And I think one of the main issues that's come about is the fact that the leather industry has generally existed separate from a lot of culture. Geographically, geographically it's always been separate, typically, in the sense that, I mean, with tanning, for example, it's a process that works with heightened skins, often can be partially it's all rotting heightened skins, and so and it has a lot of pollutants. So geographically, it was always occurred outside of city centres for obvious reasons. And this has obviously created something of a cultural separation as well. So, I mean, even in things like the Hindu caste system, they're typically referred to as the untouchables, is tanners belong to that group. Uh, you've got the same separation in places like Japan, the Middle East, the UK. Uh, one of my favorite old uh, little stories is in old Jewish uh, marriages, the, uh, the women couldn't sue for divorce from men, except in the instance that the man developed uh, leprosy, polyps, or was a tanner. And they could do that, even, they could divorce them, even if they knew they were marrying the tanner. I don't know how you keep the secret, but even if you knew, you would still do that. I think there's a great sitcom in there somewhere, I just can't figure it out. Um, so, and then even up to the 70s, Britain had one of the biggest international leather industries in the world, and people would come here to study leather. Um, unfortunately, that's not quite the case now, but as I say, just for centuries, there's been this sort of separation. Um, so, it's fantastic that we have a museum for it. So the Museum of Leathercraft has actually existed for over 70 years in some capacity or another. It existed in London as the Museum of Leathercraft, um, and then it was moved to Northampton, where it's been for quite some time the National Leather Collection. However, very recently, it has become the Museum of Leathercraft again, and has just received its accreditation from the Arts Council of England. It's a full, fully accredited museum, so you can now visit it and I'm told that you do. Uh, it has over 10,000 objects and over 30,000 documents. It's one of the biggest collection of leather objects probably in the world uh, and has thousands of documents, many of which you cannot find anywhere else. Or if you can, I can't find them anywhere else. There are things like going back to old leather journals that went back to the 50s and 60s. We've got old meetings from old leather groups. There's um, all the livery companies that have connections, all these things that you just can't find anywhere else, essentially. So, as I say, it's currently located in Northampton um, uh, and was founded in 1946. Anyway, so to give you an idea of some of the sort of the items you might have, because when I first walked into it, I wasn't really sure what I was going to get, because I was thinking, oh, it'll be shoes, it'll be loads of shoes, lots of shoes, everywhere shoes. But it's everything. It's an art form. It can be its armor. It's book bindings. It can be used for horses. It can be in harnesses. It's fashion. It's used in belting and machinery. 
There's a nice palanquin thing. Next slide. Content warning. A Toby joke made of leather. I think that thing's absolutely terrifying, but I absolutely love it because I, I think it's indicative of the fact that if you could make it of leather, someone has made it of leather. Uh, Japanese armor, little falcon hat, um, which I assume isn't a fashion thing. This, which is made of shark skin. Um, well, possibly, I have to look at it, because we found out there might be people that can be essentially faking shark skin. So my project, which is titled The English Leather Industry During the Long 19th Century, uh, the term the long 19th century is getting longer and longer the more I do it. So it's pretty much, it's pretty much the uh, 18th and 19th centuries now, its entirety, uh, right up until the invention of chrome tanning and its adoption in, which is the modern type of tanning as opposed to vegetable tanning, uh, which was widely adopted in the UK in the 1890s. Um, so there's, I mean, there's numerous benefits to starting with a um, science collection with a museum from the off, as I say, as I in my presentation, it's useful in the sense that I have, I have connections with the museum and we both have an agreement of what we're going to do. I can give a time frame. I'm not hopefully just turning up unannounced. That is, it's generally very helpful and it offers new perspectives. And going back to what I said at the beginning, there's kind of been a separation with the leather industry and academia in general. I mean, if you read a lot of economic history books, you, you might not find, or I don't find, very much written about leather at all, which is quite surreal. <laughs> so again, the second largest employer for centuries, and it, you don't really find that much written about it. Um, and to go into a place and have over 10,000 artifacts that span several cent yeah, centuries, um, going back to Egyptian loincloths, and they have, a, they have a little bit of the Dead Sea Scrolls there as well. It's quite strange, and, um, and all the way up to Victorian samples. Uh, it just to see it all in one room and to be able to actually look at it is incredibly helpful. Uh, so it's connecting communities. So the Museum of Leathercraft is also in the same building as the Leather Conservation Centre. We do a lot of amazing work. And Leather UK were a group that I got introduced to by starting this project, who um, represents current uh, UK leather interests and. Uh, the University of Northampton, uh, where the leather conservation was um, previously based, uh, and they have their own leather technology institutes and their own tannery on site, which is amazing. Uh, and the various livery companies, like the company of leather sellers who partly fund it. And most importantly, history groups that might not fall under the radar of most academics. If it's not behind a paywall, most academics, myself included, and I've done this, might not find these things because they're, they're not as easily accessible. Um, so I found out quite a lot of people from the 70s and onwards have been writing prolifically on the topic of leather, and yet it's not in academia. So it's this really weird relationship where there's so much being written, and yet at the same time, almost nothing being written. And on the flip side, there's sort of the Cambridge connections as well. There's groups like Beastercraft and Paleon, who study the, uh, prote the protein analysis and all the parchment and leather samples, looking at the microbiome of um, old animals and determining their age, their, their quality of their product, um, diet, hopefully even be able to figure out weather at some point, which is something we're looking at, which, which I know a group are looking at, which would be very interesting. Uh, Campot, which do uh, population history, so anything to do with baptism records, census records, because again, another thing is we don't really know where the leather industry was located. People that you ask who used to work in it will tell you, oh, it was located here in the modern sense, but prior to that, and if you ask any most economic historians, they'll tell you something completely different. So we kind of believe different things. So the project in general uh, kind of goes looking at hides and skins, obviously, of where, they, where they come from, but looking at the origins of these strange rectangular like, animals that emerged in the 18th century, uh, which is quite uh, these sort of almost Frankenstein domestic animals that emerged, and how that you can see that in the leather record. And also the different types of leather, because there's so many different types, and they all have slightly... As language developed, each region has a different language and refer to different things in a different way. So, and certain things might not be what they say they are. So, so like shark, um, there's a lot of places, and I see this in the British Museum, a lot of places, well, items they say is shark. 
very possibly not sharp. Because we've definitely found that there's people that were in Turkey that were basically dyeing goat skin and then rub, rubbing sort of seeds through it to make it look like shark skin. Uh, I can't tell you the difference, to be honest, uh, but I'm sure <laughs> people at the museum could. Um, it also seems to me uh, what countries are involved in terms of looking at the history of the buffalo and the UK's influence on the extinction of the buffalo. There's the leather supply, which you can actually map by weight, because for, for, from 1711 to 1829 it was taxed by weight, so you can actually say we produce 20 million um, pounds or whatever of um, uh, tanned hides, and we have so, so, much, you know, so many horse hides and so on. And that's really useful because it provides historical context for the artifacts at the museum. Well, vice versa, it also allows us to sort of date them a little bit, because obviously if we know that seal skin, for example, is not coming in until set dates, and we have seal skin in the museum, we can start to look at it from that perspective. Um, Restrict on location of the industry. So one of the groups I put on the Connecting Communities group, uh, Connecting Communities uh, slide, was Campon, who looked at baptism records and census records. So they very kindly are allowing me to look at the data that they have, so we can start to map where the leather industry was and where it was, why it was based where it was, and you know, you'd expect it to be based around bark, because it had, for a while, leather had to be made from bark, from, well, most leather. Um, and it's really interesting, even just from a family history point of view. There's a lot of people who have families that were in the leather industry and will go to places like the Museum of Leathercraft and look through their old books and say, oh, we had a, um, a member of the family that lived here and they worked in this particular tannery and oh, they worked for them. Again, because it's sort of this separated community that exists. Uh, so that's incredibly helpful. The legal history, which sounds very dull on paper, but for me is probably the most interesting bit because it's absolutely it's completely mad. It's um, essentially the leather industry has been controlled by the government for, well, it was controlled by the government for hundreds of years to a ridiculous degree, to the point that they were telling you how you had to make leather, down to what you have to use to make it, how long you have to be out, how long you have to dry it, where it had to be dried, and so on and so forth. And if you actually made it the way they told you, you wouldn't make leather. <laughs> That's how ridiculous it got. And you had to make it from bark, and then someone goes, uh, where's all the bark gone, and so on and so forth. And I think that's really interesting just as well from a perspective of um, how we came from the old economy to the modern one that most people in the economy, that I was talking about before, the old leather workers know, and the old one that they came from is quite interesting. And then finally, bringing it all together by actually looking at what they have in the museum. Because I'm hoping we can apply some historical context to everything now. And I mean, from an archaeologist's point of view, to walk into a room and essentially find 10,000 objects, catalogued, photographed, organized, boxed, all perfectly there, it's just, I mean, it's a dream come true. So that's exactly what you want to find. And yet, I was studying parchment before that, and I have no idea it was there. I don't know if that's an indictment of me, or if that's just the way things are, but I think it would be fantastic that we can finally look at everything now in context and merge it all together. Anyway, thank you.